little girl called Oliver. Paper and all right over. Now we are going to fix our way. Poor Pong. Poor Pong. Poor Long at your neck. Slow. Poor Ballo. Rawang, I'll go and go away. Rawang, I'll go and go and go and go and go and go. I was just immediately blown away by her. She, she had such an engaging smile. What really excited me about her artwork was that it was um, not a traditional indigenous type of artwork. I started asking the question, like, who's, who's seen this work? Um, is anyone doing anything about this? Her drawing is completely from her imagination. A hundred percent. She was drawing like that before she could write her own name. Totally natural talent. She did go to a couple of Aboriginal art classes and hated it because she had to sit there and do, do what she was told. She couldn't draw whatever she wanted. She had to do art for Aboriginals and she was like, no. No. Roma calls Auslan Kushia's language. But uh, I don't know, I mean, this is Kushia's language. I'm, I'm dying to see what she does with, with this gift. Yeah, what a story she has to tell. Kushia was a very long time ago, um, but I certainly remember Kushia as a client coming in. She was like a little doll. She was so beautiful. And um, I remember how devastated we were as a team of audiologists that we had to diagnose her with a profound hearing loss and explain that to the family. And um, yeah, that was really devastating for us. She was just such a delightful little girl and so beautiful. arrived we thought she was you know we saw her had a look in her ears and they were discharging and just like many of her peers from the communities they have discharging ears and we thought we'd probably just see a moderate hearing loss so we tested her hearing and got no results whatsoever we really didn't have a lot of options for for helping Kushia and aiding her which was a really frustrating um, scenario and back in those days also a cochlear implant which is a bionic ear wasn't really an option for community kids at that stage either so um, you know in different circumstances and if she'd been in different places she would have been fitted with a bionic ear and probably be um, a, a normal hearing talking child, um, adult, young adult now but um, because of where she lived and her family circumstances that wasn't an option. It's really frustrating as an audiologist that we can't offer the same services to, to those that live in town. And I think they find it really hard to, um, to pay attention and to listen and to learn, and I think it's got a lot to do with, you know, attendance at school, yeah. From very beginnings, she, um, she knew that technology had the answer for her. And so she would, she would identify somebody with a phone, or on another occasion that was a, a, a language translating device that somebody just happened to have. She'd get the device from the person, they'd just love to hand it over to her and then she'd just blow their minds with what, what she could do with it. 
I just identified, you know, from the beginning that she was a, she was a brilliant communicator. She walked into the classroom one morning and I said good morning and there was no response back and she walked from there, walked into the corner of the classroom, picked up a book and started just looking at it, looking at the pictures. And not being able to communicate, I knew nothing. So it wasn't until she actually saw a draw that I thought, yeah, there was something really beautiful and quite profound there. Her attendance was irregular, so it was really hard to get um, consistent, you know, and that learning happening. But uh, obviously she's a visual learner. If her head wasn't in a book looking at pictures, she was drawing. If she wasn't drawing, she was at home watching DVDs with her um, cousins, brothers, sisters. She'd just sit and draw the whole time. Uh, clearly loved it, you know, just immerse herself in it and be totally lost. And so she had a talent from a really, really early age. I guess having losing one sense sharpens other senses. It might have um, screened her and filtered uh, any bias that might, might have come in towards her artwork, so that's it's maybe allowed her to develop more freely into the kind of artist that she is. I learned about your needle by Marang Marang Wangai do. Kab kabal kolil be ka kolang needle be. Kushia is learning Pitjara, Pitjara sign, English language, Auslan. I didn't expect that she would vocalise in English or Pitjantjara, um, and we do expect that of the deaf. But I did think that she'd be able to to read, so that's where I started, and she. She completely resisted it. She, um, that that was, you know, that was not the way she was going to communicate. She's so self-taught from from her, you know, from her interaction with um, with technology. <laughs> Pencil Mandino, Texa, Nente Ringota, and our ally, call only the Palian Arts and John Pujurta, Kaya Turta, Gonyako Pavel, Pitta, Jol Pujurta, Kaki, Patin Pa, Monopala, Mobalo, Mapalanota, Trig and Glow of the Balanini. It's interesting looking at the dragons that she was drawing. There seemed to be partly eastern dragons mixed with western dragons. You know, she drew the dragons with the wings, and and sometimes in 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 the west, in particularly in Germany and in Europe, dragons are portrayed to be evil, and and so it was interesting to see some of her dragons who had quite evil looks. The one with the big teeth. So it's it's there's two sides to the dragon. So in one side, the dragon is the creator of life, but the dragon is also the destroyer. And you look at a lot of ancient, ancient cultures who look at the creation story uh, around dragons. So life is being created by a dragon or by dragons. And Aborigines have, a part of their creation story, have the rainbow serpent, which is a dragon, mm -hmm. a chist of English dragon. And, and I think Kushia is a dragon girl, and she relates and she can tap into that. The dragons show themselves to her. I think that she's tapping into another world. She is a very highly gifted young artist. She has a very, very good flair. If you look at many of the, the drawings that we had here, um, some of those characters, have, you look at the eyes and those, paint, uh, those drawings and they're, they're alive, they're, they're real. That artwork um, was given out as gifts often. Some people actually bought stuff for her, and she realised that you know they'd, she'd make uh, greeting cards occasionally. So they'd actually ask her if she could do it, and they would pay her properly for it. So if that opportunity was given, it's something she could make some monies from. <laughs> Hello. 
Her eye for it. Her eye for it is incredible, isn't it? When because she's in community, she'll come into the school very regularly, so almost every day. She comes in because she knows that we will have drawing materials for her. She comes also to just chat and talk with us and she enjoys the company. Um, and everybody talks to, to Kushia. That one is really good. I did it on and even though Kushia can only sign and make some noises, I guess we all grow to understand her. So we really enjoy having her around. She absolutely loves to go into the preschool and the preschool children just group around her and um, watch her draw. Kushia do this for me. I think she has a really positive influence on the whole school. I think that Kushia is a young lady um, with um, a disability who doesn't appear to have a disability in any way. Um, she's such a calm, happy soul that she makes everybody else feel calm and happy. I would love to see a future for Kushia in an industry like cartooning um, and drawing caricatures. Um, in addition to her being able to sell the amazing artworks that she, she does, um, you know, the dragons, the dogs, the, the animals, I think she's got real talent. I didn't see her for three years and in that three years her family had um, sort of tapped into as many resources as they could to provide for her. That's why I have the deepest respect for her family, that they just kept identifying resources for Kushia and somehow getting her there across the thousands of kilometres that are, that are necessary for accessing services. Because of the complexity of the support system that was required, she needed to become as communicative and educated in her Aboriginal culture as she could. Um, take pride in her, her knowledge about bush culture. One of the, one of the beautiful memories that I have was when we were coming back from Melbourne and, and we, were, we were driving back and we stopped and took a bush walk and Kushia held my hand and walked along the path and showed me where there was, you know, where there was tucker along the path even though it wasn't her, her country and she was so gentle and so reconnecting with me there. Oh, I don't know. I don't know.
And that's what Vanessa said. She just, she just said, Kushia will be an artist. Vanessa provided what she could to, um, to have that happen. You know, when we went to Melbourne, she went around to the art galleries in Melbourne. She found them probably on the WWW, which I was profoundly ignorant in at that stage. Um, <laughs> um, she was 15 when Kushia was born and she patiently saw that she needed to sort of grow me up as a possible mother for Kushia. When I went to Vanessa's, she's saying that her mum's Vanessa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she went to her funeral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, about two years ago. Kipilajara, mm -hmm. up near the Northern Territory. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Can't imagine losing your mother. I haven't lost my mum. Sorry. Um. Uh. There are tears. Um. For her, you know, um, what she's l losing her mother, whom she had a very strong connection to, and anyone who knew her mother will know what I'm talking about. She's a beautiful woman. I, th I thought she was a smart woman. Strong, prepared to go to the lengths that were necessary. When her mum died, um, I was the one that had to tell her. So at that time, it was a, a very traumatic time for her. Those areas of difficulty, for someone to actually understand about um, someone dying, for Cushy, she understood that, she'd been to Surrey Camps and that, but when it's your own mother, for us to be able to explain that to her and her to be able to comprehend it, and then to us to be able to work with the grief and loss in that was uh, something we really had to think carefully with. She was quite an emotional girl as well, that came out in her art. I believe that everyone needs to express themselves whether they feel the need or not. I feel like it comes out in other ways and I definitely believe she was wanting to be heard. It was quite disturbing some of the things she used to draw. Yeah, she's, she's been through a lot, old Kush. When you look at the layers of the psyche, the, the very soft part, the child part, the creative part of a person, and if Kushia has lost her mother, that part, I would assume, has got some injury from the trauma. And so when, we, when we're dealing with people who have childhood trauma, we encourage them to draw. So this part of itself, can, can, that, that part can expre express itself. And so it makes sense that partly her drawings would be really dark, you know, fierce dragons, that would have been her fears and her, her anger and whatever's going on. But yet also see a lot of hope and a lot of magic in her drawing. And that's what makes me think she's connected to the other world. It's not just, they're not just drawings about trauma and about um, sadness and about loss, but they're also drawings about hope and about connectedness, particularly with some of those dragons that have such beautiful expressions. There are many people who love Kushia very much. Oh, 
Look like a lot of money. Mm. 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 She's no, very smart. Talking. And she knew she's brains. She's well, very clever girl. That's what I did. Oh. <laughs> she can tell without talking. But you can talk through the paper. Oh, there is a dragon. Oh, she might go to the, to the painting of the Captain Turbo. She might win a reward, you know? For her to be, learn the independence, to be able to learn um, how to talk to people for making sure that she was safe. In a small community like Pip, she knew everybody, everybody knew her. So sometimes she wasn't wise in saying no to people. When we'd take her out on recreation, our children would be working with something, she'd go over and talk to people that she didn't know at a table having coffee. I developed these cards. Like I have a baby with a no sign over it because she used to go up to mothers and TTP and touch their children because she loved kids. But she, you don't go up to a stranger and touch their baby. Yes, she's a very social child. She used to nick off in the city quite often for the comic book uh, shop and run away. And so in the end, the comic book shop guy had our numbers and we had his. And then after a while, she wanted to ride home. She'd give them the card and someone would have to come pick her up. But after a while, those shopkeepers also knew and told her, no, you need to walk home. <laughs> and we taught them how to teach her. I don't think she ever paid for a bus fare, hey? Because like, she would just not understand. And the bus driver would be like, okay, yep, you know, get off then. All right, yep, hop on, sort of thing, to sort of just save face. She has knowledge of two very different worlds. I, I actually have a bit of a soft spot for science fiction and science fantasy and when I saw her artwork I was just uh, Im immediately connected to it and, and blown away by the, the quality of it because she was only a, a young girl. I, I don't think that we have a, enough artists that are working um, in, in the field of science fiction. Hey, cool! You want to put that up here? Maybe we could have our first uh, Indigenous superhero. I work for myself. I'm a visual artist and I do a lot of drawings and paintings. And I create work that is related in a spiritual link to other people. Excellent, because she is saying excellent. Mm -hmm. I believe um, because we um, don't hear, but our visual skills are really in tune. Deaf people see things differently and observe things a little bit differently. And I find that if you give deaf people the chance to do it themselves, they come up with some brilliant work and you can see something amazing. And I believe that deaf people are visionary. That's what I believe. You've got a really good eye for size and feeling, really good spiritual eye for history as well, I feel. And that's what really impacted upon me. I've seen a lot of Indigenous art 
and a lot of dot paintings mm -hmm. and Cushy's yeah, is very different uh, and yeah. I, I got really excited yeah, yeah. really excited yeah. about what yeah. her possible yeah. future would be as yeah. she grows yeah. and gets older yeah. and older and actually develops that skill yeah. even yeah. deeper yeah. and Cushy's saying oh no yeah. don't talk about yeah. me like that <laughs> <laughs> don't do that <laughs> oh look at her work wow so exciting to watch this Look at the good colouring that she's mixed in there and the shading. She has a talent. I believe we're all equal. We're all equal. And so she can do it. Oh, I really love it. Thank you. Thank you as well. <laughs> yes, she's very loving. You know, she, she does care about people and she remembers people well. Her memory of people is very, very good. She remembers people for many years and it, it's a delight, you know, it's a delight to see her. Yes, isn't that true? She was the most beautiful, gentle soul that I'd ever met. Um, even in the early years, she had magnificent art skills and she would sit there every recess and every lunchtime and she would just draw for the other kids and they were like moths to a flame. She just shined. She just No way. Oh my god. Wow. That is impossible. Wow. That is good. That is so amazing. That is really good. That's the work of a true artist. They would just sit there and she would hand out these gifts, and there were children who had whole files of them. Um, you know, they were. Her artwork was really precious to all the children in the school. That's fabulous, Kushia. She even prepared little videos, um, counting videos and poems for junior primary classes. And we've said to our deaf students, you know, she was a, a student here at Clemsic, she was a deaf student, and look what she's done with her life. And this is possible for you. Oh. Oh, don't. <laughs> you cry and I'll cry. <laughs> you should be very proud. Yes, I am proud. <laughs> I'm very proud. <laughs> when I saw her walking into the staff room, I just realised how much I've actually missed her. And when she left, it wasn't the same when she left the school. About the age of seven, she came down. She came with no language. So it was really difficult with her. And she was really scared and frustrated about, with everyone because she couldn't communicate. And it made it really hard. So, but through her artwork, we were able to teach her patience and life skills and language. It was through her drawing and my drawing that we established a communication system. So that's how I actually showed her the signs for things. So we would draw the pictures and then that's how she would pick up the signs. And that's through that is how we taught her life skills. I strongly believe with our art, she would have limitations in her future. But with her art skills, she has a bright future. It's part of who she is. I believe she can see good in people. She can tell who's dodgy and who's not, almost like a spiritual connection to people. So when she meets people, like she says, she has said before, like that person has a personality of like a dragon or a bird. She sort of relates people to creatures or animals. She looked at me, you know, gave me a hug, very happy. 
and she saw I could I had a tattoo on my wrist which is a butterfly and she basically said oh that's right I remember that you're a butterfly and I was shocked I said to Cushy do you remember that and she nodded at me and said absolutely That's because I used to get quite angry at her a lot, okay? <laughs> this is what I love about people who are so connected with nature. They just connect. And that's what I can see with her. She just connects, you know, with her hands, with her whole being. And that's so beautiful. And, and we, in many ways, we lost that. You know, we don't know how to do that anymore. But po possibly because she can't hear, that made it even stronger for her to connect through her energy and through her hands. And that's... That's beautiful. Kushia had a natural bond with animals, as a lot of young people with disabilities do. Um, and when she was with dogs, she was calm and she used to draw dogs and animals and fairy creatures all the time. And so we uh, enrolled her into the Labs and Life program, which is a specialised program for people with autism mainly. She did walk off with a dog once, not too far. <sighs> She'd walk off with a lot of things. She walked out of DVD shops with DVDs, but you know, you can't help but laugh, you, you know, you, you, and you could never be angry at her <laughs> because she's cushier. No one knows the inner workings of Cushier's mind. Day in and day out, she was a character and she did make our lives um, sometimes frustrated, sometimes hilarious. Hey, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody who's come from near and far to be with us this evening and part of this very important moment in Kushia's life. We know that this room is filled with people whose lives have been touched by Kushia over her 20 year journey. It's a testament to her gentle nature and positive aura that she has such a wide and diverse group of friends and supporters. Hers is a solitary world, but she is far from alone, as we can see from tonight's fantastic turnout. This week she spent time drawing here with the students of St Aloysius and also with students from Clemsic Primary School. The students she worked with were astounded by her speed and the detail of her creations. During one of these sessions, as she was drawing a dragon on a whiteboard with lightning speed, one student was heard saying, this can't be happening. 
That sense of wonder at Kushia's unique artistic brain is, I think we'll all agree, felt deep within us. So please, this evening, walk around and enjoy Kushia's work. The artist herself is here drawing at the table and is happy to create any special requests. We are all so pleased that Kushia and her family could travel to be with us this evening in Adelaide to showcase her amazing drawings to a city audience for the first time. We hope it will be the first of many exhibitions for her and that this will serve as a catalyst for a long and successful career in the arts industry for this amazingly talented young woman. I'd like to bring Kushia up here now so we can all show One, two, three, four. You know, there's very few opportunities for Indigenous boys and girls, men and women out in, in such a remote location. She's a young person with a great imagination and a, a great verve for life and she should be encouraged as an artist who happens to be Aboriginal. It's so keen for her to um, to know that she has her own story. There's no reason why she couldn't do it, and I think this is a beautiful way to communicate what you want to say through your dragons, particularly to children, you know, who love to even look at pictures, even if there's no text there. It's, it's one beautiful way of doing it. I'd love to see her do posters for movies or uh, comic books or something like that. Or come out with her own range. She should stick them on t-shirts, you know. Young kids would love them. I'd love for Kushia to travel around the world and show her all different arts around the world so that, so that the world can recognise her as a deaf Aboriginal artist. This is my grandfather's land. She's only in her early 20s. It's brought her this far. This is my She's doing something she loves. I mean, isn't that the ultimate for all of us? This is my sacred land. I think she's got a pretty beautiful life. Please don't make no fire. Please don't make no fire. Please don't make no fire.